This is Deborah Atkinson, and you're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top questions and the things you struggle with most so you can have more energy and less decision fatigue about what to eat, how to move, and you can change your thoughts to Flip 50 with the life and the energy you love in this second half. And my guest today is Terry Cochran. I'm so excited to bring her on. Terry is an internationally known health expert specializing in complex and chronic conditions, as well as bringing elite performers to their highest potential. She recently authored the Amazon number one new release book, The Wildatarian Diet, Living as Nature Intended. Terry's thriving practice is based in the Metro DC area. And if you're a listener, a regular listener to Flipping 50, you know she was just recently on in a roundup about gut health while traveling. And we are here to dive deep into good gut and sitting down to a dinner we enjoy and can feel good about it. Hey, Terry, so glad you're here. Hi, Deborah. So good to be with you and your audience. So tell us about the diet. And by the way, you all can't see this, but I am sitting here with a copy of the Wildatarian Diet book. You should get one if you don't have one. Tell us about the Wildatarian Diet. What is it? And well, the, why is it good for us? Well, the Wildatarian diet really breaks all prior paradigms. We say we're rule breakers because the, the, the rules are broken. Uh, <laughs> the old rules don't apply anymore. And so we now know that there is no one diet that fits everyone. Not everyone can do high fat diets. Not everyone can do paleo diets. Not everyone can do vegan or vegetarian diets. And we say that this is the diet for everyone and it is a diet that is suited specifically for you at the same time because the whole genesis of the wild Italian diet and lifestyle really arose from what I call my patient zero who had end stage amyloidosis. This is a very rare form of cancer um, that wherein he was building amyloids, which are in his case, there are these aberrant proteins, which became cancerous that wrapped around his heart. And so when he came to see me, he was, he had been given his last rites and he was on oxygen and he had just um, suffered congestive heart and kidney failure as a result of two failed rounds of chemotherapy. And uh, when he came to see me and said, Terry, I have amyloidosis, I'm like, I don't even know how to spell that, much less pronounce it. What the heck is that? (laughs) And so therefore my journey started down the path of how to research amyloids. And so what I found was that that there are truncated protein structures that are indigestible. And the body makes amyloids naturally, but our repair mechanisms allow them to be assimilated and they're actually helpful. But when we hit a tipping point, they become harmful. And so where the heck are these amyloids coming from? Well, the body of research that we undertook showed that it is from domesticated animals, particularly chicken and beef, that carry these because of their crowding conditions. They're carrying these little amyloid structures in their tissue, and then we're eating them, and it's aggregating in our tissue. And now amyloids have been implicated in top 50 major health conditions in our country, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, kidney disease, heart disease, um, autoimmune conditions, diabetes, endocrine dysfunction. It's everywhere. And, you know, I'm so happy to share with you, Deborah, that this gentleman whose name is Glenn, who was never supposed to make it, came in to see me today, five years later, and he's doing fabulously. Yeah. How exciting. So well. And, you know, I didn't even recognize him. He was tan. He was fit. He rides his bike to work. He's a tax attorney downtown. He rides his bike to work. He was told he never been able to, you know, much, you know, walk, much less ride a bike. So the, the wildatarian diet is based on the tenets of what I call the big three. So protein, fat, and sulfur malabsorption. Protein malabsorption being those animals that are rich in amyloids that are kicking our butts. Um, another discovery that I made is around sulfur. Now, sulfur, and especially for us women who are flipping 50 and men who are flipping 50, we need sulfur to convert to sulfate to help us with our collagen structure, which is so important for our bones and our tendons and our tissues and our healthy skin and even our healthy neurotransmitters, our feel-good dopamine and serotonin and so forth. But unfortunately, our food supply, once again, um, the glyphosate, which is a an herbicide found, uh, excuse me, it's a poison found in our herbicide roundup, 
is stopping the body's ability to process sulfur and convert it to the much needed sulfate. So all of these healthy foods, such as broccoli and cabbage and kale, the ever popular kale, may be hurting you. And then the third piece of the wildatarian diet is fat. And so we need fat. Our 60% of our brains are made up of fat. And as we age, we really need that fat to support, again, the collagen structure and our, our brain cells. However, stress is stopping us from being, being able to assimilate those fats. And they, okay. and they agree. We're in trouble. <laughs> so we're in trouble. And so what the wildatarian diet does is it unpacks specifically which type of wildatarian you are. And I've developed four major archetypes. And when you take our quiz online, you will be able to know just which type of wildatarian you are. And what's so cool, Deborah, is I was at a, a, a leadership conference this weekend and this woman who I didn't know came up to me and she said, I bought your book. I, I was a WS wildatarian, meaning I was a low sulfur wildatarian and the rash that I have had on my skin for over 30 years disappeared disappear. Oh. So she said, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so, you know, these foods that we think are healthy for us, she was eating healthily. She was eating broccoli. She was eating kale. She was eating lots of garlic. She, she told me her story. She was eating lots of proteins, which were indigestible and becoming a wildatarian. It took her less than three months to solve a condition that had plagued her for decades. This is the power of this diet. Um, and it is more than a diet because I have decided that the word diet needs to be redefined. Um, most of us think of diet as a deprivation-based, low vibration state word that is going to be temporary. Therefore, we're going to go back to the way we're eating. And because I want this to be a lifestyle of abundance and sustainability, I decided to redefine diet to that which we consume beyond our food. It's our thoughts, our environment, who we hang out with. And so everything that we consume in life becomes our diet. And if we choose substitution and abundance and sustainability, diet becomes a word that we can actually live in balance with. And, so, and you can happily say, I am on my wildatarian diet and I've never felt younger and more vibrant. So I'm really excited to redefine diet. Yes. And we're on the same bus on that one, for sure. Love that. But okay, so let's dive in because you just told our listeners, a whole lot of information that might be confounding. Okay. So protein that, um, they're being told, in fact, I'm being, I'm telling them, you know, protein is good for them. A lot of those foods that contain sulfur, like you said, they're, they're great known as quote unquote healthy foods. And then fat, we're all being told more fat is actually better for satiety. So we need to take the quiz, obviously because that'll solve a lot of questions about which one are you, but where do these things start backfiring and what, what signs and symptoms might we be having that one of these is probably us? That's a great question. And again, when we talk about low sulfur and low fat and a different type of protein, we're not talking about that for the rest of our lives. We're just talking for a rebalancing phase so our gut can heal and seal. And then we will have a respectful relationship with those foods that may not be our optimal foods. So great question. So let's say you might be protein malabsorbed. How do you know that? Well, one way to know is you're burping after eating. You're probably on a protein pump inhibitor, those antacids that inhibit protein digestion. You have trouble building muscle even though you work out at the gym regularly. You get lightheaded. You feel full after eating. You have undigested uh, uh, food in your stool. Those are all signs of protein malabsorption. And so, the, you know, our, our, our earth was intended to give us everything that we needed to survive and thrive, including animals and plants and nuts and seeds. However, we're no longer eating what nature intended us to eat because our food supply has become compromised with herbicides and pesticides and genetically modified seeds and pollutants from the air and plastics and so forth. And so we have to get back to that original form of eating so we can digest it. And so with protein, what we say is if you have um, an issue digesting protein, instead of beef, eat bison or elk or antelope. Um, and therefore, and so forth and so on, or eat wild fish and uh, wild shellfish, which are abundantly available even in most national grocery stores. 
Um, in terms of sulfur, how do you know if you have a sulfur sensitivity? Well, one, if you have a sulfur drug allergy, you have a sulfur sensitivity. That's a big hello. Stop eating sulfur for now. Um, the second thing is we call asparagus the tattletale. If you can smell it on the way out in your urine, that's a symptom of sulfur malabsorption. If you have sensitivities to sulfates and sulfites like deli meat, or um, if you get uh, allergic reactions for eating at the salad bar, which has um, MSG for to help brighten the food. If you have asthma, if you have ADHD, if you have any potential mental health issues, those, if you have arthritis, if you have calcifications in other places, those are signs and symptoms of potential sulfur malabsorption. And so for a time, we're going to just pull back the curtain on all those happy sulfur foods and keep them off your plate so the body doesn't keep leaking the gut. Sulfur malabsorption has also been linked directly to Crohn's, to ulcerative colitis, and to irritable bowel. And I was just recently on a TV show, a news show, where this beautiful 70-year-old woman had flown in from Texas to see me. She was down to eating three foods. She had been sick for 50 years, five oh decades. God. She was desperate. And when she came to see me, she said, Terry, I've heard you might be able to help me. And I said, wow, 50 years. That's a long time. In her case, she needed to be a low sulfur wildatarian. And she has transformed her life after 50 years. And she just, her gut is beautifully working. She's no longer in pain arthritically. And she just sent me an email last week saying, and my hair is beautiful again. <laughs> so it, that's amazing. It is amazing. And, you know, it, for the, for the news uh, cast, they actually interviewed her as well. And she'd already, she'd embroidered uh, this apron saying, we're wildatarians, <laughs> which, which I thought was such a beautiful thing because here he, she is, a 70-year-old woman who was told, you're only going to get worse over time. Deal with it, you know, and deal with your pain and your joint pain and your gut pain. And, you know, I'm sorry, we don't know what to tell you to eat because food has nothing to do with it, right? But of course, that has everything to do with it. So, yeah. you know, that was just such a heartwarming story that nothing is impossible to heal from no matter what age we are. If we give our body what it needs, the body responds. So, so those are, those are t uh, telltale signs for sulfur. And wow. Okay. What about fat? So fat, fat's a big deal. We absolutely need fat. And, and as women, we need fat to help us look younger and help us balance hormones. However, when we hit that tipping point, Eating more fat, even healthy fats, can be a real problem. So how do we know? Well, we have acne. We have PMS. We have heavy periods. We have bumps on the back of our arms. We look down at our stool. We, we always say, let's talk poop because poop talks back. And it tells us what's going on in our body. And so if your stool is light colored or if it's floating or if it's, if it's not formed very well, if you don't have a gallbladder, um, because you weren't able to, you know, assimilate fats very well. Those are those are big telltale signs of fat malabsorption. And so what we do is we, again, I call it the accordion. So we're going to come really closely in on that accordion. And even healthy nuts that people say, eat your nuts, eat your nuts. One of our um, one of our our colleagues uh, just recently became a client of mine, and. She said that after five days of being a low fat, low sulfur wildatarian, her symptoms were 90% better. And she posted it on Facebook, 90% better. And she was a woman who was eating all these healthy fats, but weren't healthy for her. Wow. And so, you know, nuts and seeds can be good, but not maybe if you're, if you've tipped that scale on not being able to process fats. And, and one of the fallacies is I can't process fats. That means I need to eat more fat. <laughs> no, you can't process <laughs> fats. That means hold back on the fat for now. So you stop leaking your gut and then you slowly introduce fats. Avocado is a great short chain fat. Butter is a great short chain fat. Seeds like sunflower and pumpkin are short chain fats that could be introduced, but slowly as we start recovering from that fat malabsorption. Wow. So you really have honed in. You've got this 
diagnostic tool. We need to take it for sure. What about the wildetarian lifestyle for somebody who right now says, well, I don't have any of those. I mean, is there still value? Are we being kind of premeditative to do it because we're in a society where more likely we're more likely to become sensitive to one of these foods? I think that's a great question again. And I have officially flipped 50. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. A while ago I flipped 50 and I will tell you since becoming a wildetarian in my my be- my scenario was I'm a low sulfur wildetarian. I've always been fit but my muscle mass I became so lean I, I didn't change my workout that much. I'm just leaner and fitter and one of the things that was the most obvious for me is because I see multiple clients a day and I'm go 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 is that I used to get a sugar imbalance. I would get hypoglycemic, meaning my sugar would drop. And because what I didn't understand is I wasn't fully availing myself of the amino acids is that that's how when protein breaks down, we need to break it down from into amino acids that helps glucose metabolism. My blood sugar is so much more stable. I'm so much leaner. And I will tell you, I work with elite athletes and I have improved their performance multiple fold by becoming having them become wildetarians. One case in particular, an international rugby player who wanted to get back. He had just recently retired. He, he traveled all over the world. He's a great spokesperson for the sport. And he said, Terry, I want to get back to my professional shape. He had just recently retired. He is fitter than he was when he was at the peak of his game. He needed to become a low sulfur wildetarian as well. And so we take individuals. You can be anywhere on your health continuum. But what we know is that we're no longer able to process these foods optimally anymore. We just don't have the capacity because it's sort of like trying to put um, you know, a big piece of meat through, through a sausage grinder that doesn't have sharp blades. It's going to take a long time to break it down and it won't be broken down to its lowest common denominator to make good sausage. That's what's happening. We don't have the digestive capacity to break down these amyloids. Even if we can, you know, even if we don't have quote unquote protein malabsorption, we're just asking our body to work harder. And why should we do that? If we can have bison instead of beef, or you can have wild salmon, or you can have this wonderful, um, you know, Branzino fish or wild caught shrimp or wonderful lamb instead of you know these these chickens that have been crowded and really tortured similar to our beef and our pork why not choose wild it's just it's just the best way to go it's the optimal way to live and really there's a taste difference oh absolutely it is so delicious i i on i i promise you once you go wild you won't go back <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I'm a little nervous about that. So all you listeners, I was talking to Terry in the green room and literally I had to text her yesterday because I was dying because I didn't have time. I'm up here in the mountains to quote unquote, go to town and I was out of dog food, but I had this frozen elk in the freezer. So my dog is now wildetarian. Yes, true. <laughs> well, you know, I, we say you can be wild at any age, at any stage. We have wildetarian babies. You know, we've got wild kids everywhere and they're doing so much better in school. It's, it's unbelievable what it can do to the brain as well. Okay. So I want to go back to, because I think this might be a kind of a nagging question among listeners. So is any chicken good chicken? <sighs> Well, over time, we say 80-20, <laughs> the 80-20 rule. If it is a happy chicken that's lived on a happy farm and your gut has really better integrity, then yes, some chicken is okay. We do know that clinically the studies show chicken out of all the animals carry the highest amyloid load. So, you know, never eat chicken, maybe not. You know, maybe that's too harsh, but we say, you know, navigate that and you can have Cornish game hen instead. Um, although not technically wild, we found that they are much lower in amyloids. And so I've personally adopted the uh, approach to not eat chicken. And I will tell you, I was a big chicken eater 
And I thought I was doing my myself a good service, but my bowels have never been more regular in my life since going wildatarian. It's just, I everything is just working the way it should. And I always struggled in that department. So um, I'm just so happy that I'm wild and, and, and everything else is working the way it should. So we're talking, you know, about these three specifics, the protein, the sulfur, and the fat. And one thing we haven't really talked about, which I think is, it's always on the mind of my listeners, I know, is what about, you know, the macros? Let's talk about, what about the carbohydrates? Yes. We haven't talked great. carbs. What about uh, that? Thank you. Uh, you're just, great questions, Deborah. So we are an equal opportunity wildatarian. <laughs> You could be a plant-based wildatarian. You could. Be a- I think you just made a lot of fans. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and we can be. A, you know, we can be a combination wildatarian. So uh, there's a whole chapter dedicated in my book to wildatarian grains. Um, I love the grains of oat. Oat is great in managing cholesterol. It's a great hormone balancer. Quinoa is a complete plant-based protein. Buckwheat, we call it the buck, not wheat, because it has no wheat in it. It's confusing to individuals who are gluten-free saying, I can't eat buckwheat. I'm like, yes, you can. It's the buck, not wheat. Um, We love brown rice. We love millet and teff and amaranth and mahogany rice. So those are great grains. The not so good grains, corn is a problemo. Corn 88% of corn is genetically modified and corn carries this little word called mycotoxin, which are fungal metabolites, which are making our gut biome dysregulated because it's a fire starter for bacteria and other viruses that may have been happily playing in the sandbox, as I call it. So no, we are not anti-grain and we believe, and the studies show that if you have zero grains over time, the gut population will be less happy. So we are pro-grain. We just have to be the right grain for you. And the book also goes on to explain, you know, if you've had a lot of kidney stones or gall stones, or if you've had a lot of yeast infections and you're having some mental health imbalances, then certain other healthy foods. So for example, in that case, you may want to back off oats and quinoa for a little bit because they're considered high oxalate foods. Oxalates are just becoming um, known in um, the nutrition and scientific community. That's why we say our mantra is there's no one healthy food for everyone throughout your life. Even if you can assimilate it at one point in your life, let's just say you've had a baby and you before before you were pregnant, you could tolerate fats. But now you've just had a baby and your horm- you had a massive hormone rush. You might have to be a low fat person for a little bit until those hormones get back into place. Or you just got a yeast infection. You want to be low, low on the grain front because yeast feeds on sugar and grains eventually metabolize to sugar. So again, it's learning how to interpret those body signals. And one of the things that we say, we're all education, but my practice in the book is all about educating the reader and the consumer because from education comes empowerment. And so we teach you all how to become your own body interpreter, your own body detective to interpret those warning signs when the body starts going a little bit sideways before you fall off the cliff. And I will tell you over and over again, my clients come in and say, Terry, I figured it out. You know, I had this and I knew exactly what happened. Or I felt this way and it resulted in me becoming fat mile absorbed because I overstressed. So they really are becoming tuned in. And ultimately, that's what we want to do. We need to know to listen. So we, we teach you body, the body talk language. We teach you how to interpret that which your body is trying to communicate on a daily basis. So good. So good. And I, I know my listeners, this is an area where we've been ignoring ourselves, right? Women flipping 50 have been caregiving and, you know, career giving and giving, giving, giving. And, you know, it's not been time to listen. And now it is. So we're coming back to it. Oh, I love it. I'm so excited. Actually, I want to get everybody off the show to go take the quiz. But before we do that, I want to ask you the hardest question of the day. Are you ready? Let's do it. You're sitting down? Okay. 
rarely do I ask, are you sitting down? But I am. Um, okay. So is there a question I should have asked you? What did the I The question you should have asked me is how hard is it? Ah, okay. okay. Great. So what I would say is any change is going to feel uncomfortable because we tend to gravitate towards the familiar. But once the change becomes a little bit less uncomfortable because it's less new, it becomes part of who you are. You get into that vibration and that vibe of, man, I'm just going to be wild. I'm going to come home and I'm going to put some bison steaks on the grill instead of you know beef tenderloin. And it, it becomes this, this empowering ceremony of really gratitude because your body is thanking you in very big ways because you're feeling more vibrant. You have more bit mental acuity. All of a sudden, you're into that size that you never thought you'd get into. And not that, but if you were pre-diabetic, your numbers look awesome. This week, I just had somebody three months. He just wanted to be given three months. He had a hemoglobin A1C of 6.7. That is diabetic. It dropped to 5.7 in three months. He dropped 15 pounds and he was eating more than he had been. That is great feedback. So any change is going to seem uncomfortable. And what I would say is just stay with the discomfort for a little bit and move into it. The the book gives you recipes and shopping lists for places that you can buy this food. And it's going to thank you. And it becomes really, we have the wildatarian tribe. These people that are start working together because I end up working with one person in a company and then I end up working with 50 people in their company. And then they become, you know, they, they become a tribe of community, a community of this new mindset that nothing is impossible to heal from. And everybody's educated and it becomes really, you know, part of the, the lunch dialogue. Oh, did you have this Mediterranean quinoa salad last night? What'd you put in it? Man, that was awesome. You know, and, and so you can really, it's really delicious. That's the thing. Uh, don't be afraid of change. That's the thing. Awesome. Such a, such a great way to wrap up. And so for all of you listeners who are walking or lifting or commuting right now, I've got you covered. There is a place where you can go and take the quiz. I'm going to link to that at terrycochran.com forward slash wildatarian type quiz. So come back and grab that. And Terry, they get a free chapter with five recipes. That's amazing. Okay. So um, you can also connect with Terry and the tribe at Terry Cochran Beyond Nutrition and Wildatarian. I will link to all of her social goodness as well. And listeners, if you've got a question for Terry that we missed or I missed, leave it below the show link at flipping50.com and join us on our Flipping 50 TV Facebook page to get all the juicy resources and links that we mentioned in the show. Visit today's episode at flipping50.com forward slash wildatarian. And if you enjoyed the show, please leave a rating in iTunes and then share this with a friend to surround yourself with a supportive community of women on the same journey. What are you waiting for? Start flipping 50 today.